In this video we're going to be looking at topic 2a and we're going to be looking at the first section which is about isotopes and mass spectrometry and this is part of the IAS chemistry course from Edexcel. So some of this will be revision that we're going to be looking at the structure of the atom and the relative mass and charge of the subatomic particles, what we mean by atomic number and mass number, how we can use these numbers to determine our subatomic particles, what we mean by an isotope, and then the new part for our A-level is about the basic principles of a mass spectrometer and be able to predict the mass spectra for specific diatomic molecules. So in GCSE, you learned that all atoms contain three subatomic particles. So we have protons, neutrons, and electrons. So this should be nothing new to you. Our mass for our proton and our neutron are each one, and our electron is 1 over 1840, sometimes written as 1836, just depends. Your charge is your proton is your positive, your neutron is neutral, and your electron is negative. And we also know that we find the protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and the electrons are found in what we call quantum shells. So in GCSE, you probably called them energy levels, but we'll talk more about this later in topic 2a when we talk about the electron shells and how we arrange the electrons. So we've also discussed back in GCSE atomic number. So atomic number is the number of protons that are in an atom. We looked at mass number being the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Because remember it's everything that has that mass of one that is in the centre of the nucleus. We also mentioned isotopes, and isotopes are atoms of the same element, so they have the same atomic number, but a different mass number. So that because they are atoms of the same element, they have the same protons, but because they have a different mass number, that tells us that they must have a different number of neutrons. Now be aware a question could ask you to explain what an isotope is in terms of the subatomic particles, well, you have to mention protons and neutrons, or they can simply say in terms of atomic number or mass number. So just make sure to read the question carefully. And the most common example that we use is chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. Notice that they both have the same number of protons and of course the same number of electrons, and these balance out because our atoms are neutral. So the positives and negatives are going to balance, but we have this different number of protons. So chlorine 35 has, sorry, different number of neutrons. Chlorine 35 has 18 neutrons and chlorine 37 has 20. Now, when we're talking about the relative atomic mass, you did meet this last year and we're just going to kind of tighten up the definition that we use, we say that this is the weighted mean average of an atom of an element compared to one twelfth of the mass of carbon 12. So when we're talking about relative, it's because all of the masses of these atoms are all measured relative to the mass of carbon 12. So carbon 12 is our standard, and then we measure all of the masses of any other atom using that standard. And when we have our relative atomic mass, of course, we're making sure that we're taking into account our average of all of our isotopes. And we'll look at the calculation for that in just a second. Relative isotopic mass is the mass of a particular isotope relative to one twelfth the mass of carbon twelve. So this would be looking at the mass of carbon, sorry, chlorine thirty five or a chlorine thirty seven as opposed to chlorine as a whole. And each of these relative isotopic masses and the percentage abundance of the isotopes is used to calculate the relative atomic mass. And you did this back in GCSE, so this should not be new to you. So we have our example here. We have lithium that has isotopes of two relative isotopic masses, so 6.015 and 7.016. Notice that in today's the A level, we have much more accurate values. Probably back in GCSE, you would have just seen six and seven, whereas at A level, we use much more accurate isotopic values. We've got our percentage abundances, so 7.59% and 92.41. So you calculate the relative atomic mass by doing the mass 
times the abundance plus the mass times the abundance. And you do that for as many isotopes as you have, and then you divide all of them by 100. Okay, because you're obviously using percentages here. So you've got 6.015 times 7.59 added to 7.016 times 92.41, which gives you this number here. And we divide it all by 100 and we get a relative atomic mass of lithium to three significant figures of 6.94. Now let's shift to look at mass spectrometry. So this is the new part at A level, and this is the part that you've most likely not seen before. So the first mass spectrometer was built back in 1918, so just over 100 years ago, by Francis Aston, and he was a student of J.J. Thomson, and J.J. Thomson being famous and winning the Nobel Prize for discovering the electron. So what Francis Aston did is he used the instrument to show that they were different forms of the same element and we now call these isotopes. So before this point, isotopes were just theorised and potential that we may have different masses, but we didn't necessarily know why. So we used the mass spectrometer in order to prove that isotopes exist and then expand our knowledge of atomic theory. So remember back in 1918, atomic theory was still being developed and we didn't know the model of the atom that we know now. So we need to know what happens in a mass spectrometer and how we then interpret the spectra. Now, what you will find is that old specification papers ask you in great detail how a mass spectrometer works. Now, the new specification does not require that, but it's good for you to know the process, but you're not going to be asked what are the steps in a mass spectrometer you're more likely to you're going to be asked about the analysis part so basically what we do in a mass spectrometer is the particles are turned into positive ions so we take our atoms we turn them into ions we accelerate them and then we deflect them using an electric or a magnetic field and i'm going to show you what that looks like in just a minute Okay, the path that the ion is going to take when it is deflected is all going to depend on something called its mass to charge ratio. And you may see this written as MZ or ME. Particles with a very large mass to charge value are going to be deflected the least in the mass spectrometer. And those with a low MZ value are going to be deflected the most. And what we have at the end of the mass spectrometer is a detector that allows it, the machine to detect what mass charge ratios there are going to be. And that tells us the mass of each isotope. So if we have two isotopes that will each have a different mass to charge ratio, they will be deflected differently and then they will be detected at different points. So mass spectrometry was initially used to identify isotopes back when they were first being utilised. Nowadays, we use them to calculate molecular masses or if we make a new compound, a new synthesis, such as an organic substance, we will use that just to, to find some information about the structure. And you will come back and cover this in topics 10 of A-level, topic 15 and topic 20 of A2. So this is what a mass spectrometer looks like, okay? Um, and as I said, in old specification papers, you may be given this diagram and asked to explain it. You are not going to be asked that in the new spec, but it's good for you to understand how this works. So we take our sample that we want to verify the isotopes and work out the abundances, and then we vaporize the sample, meaning we turn it into a gas. It then passes through this point here called the ionization chamber, and this makes the positive ions. These positive ions then pass through an electric field, and it's at this point that they are accelerated. And as they are accelerated, they will pass through the tube and you can see here that they pass through a magnetic field. And when we have this magnetic field, this is where 
they are deflected. And you can see that we now have three different paths. And then at the end, they are detected. So the, the five steps that we use for a mass spectrometer is we vaporize the sample into a gas, we ionize them, and the charge that we get is typically a one plus charge. We are looking for the ions to become one plus so that their mass to charge ratio is simply going to be their mass. So if you have a mass of, let's say 16, and the charge is one, my mass to charge ratio is going to be 16, telling me that the, that isotope has a mass of 16. And we'll look at what happens if it has a two plus charge later. So once they are made into ions, they are accelerated by this electric field. They are then deflected using the magnetic field, and then they are detected using various different methods, so either electric or photographic. But remember, you're not going to be asked which method is being used. So the path that the isotope is going to follow is going to all be dependent on this mass to charge ratio or the MZ ratio. So because the ions of heavier isotopes are going to have larger MZ values, so for example, chlorine 37 would have a mass to charge ratio of 37, whereas chlorine 35 would have a mass to charge ratio of 35. So the heavier isotope, the 37, is going to have a different path and it's going to have a larger curve as opposed to the chlorine 35. Now, as I've said, the majority of the ions are one positive charge, so the amount of separation is all just due to the mass. So your heavier masses and your lighter masses are going to follow two different pathways. If the ion somehow gets a two positive charge, it's going to be deflected even more. And this is because its MZ value is going to be halved. So if we have 37 over two and 35 over two, we're going to get different masses, mass to charge ratios as we would if it was a one plus. Now, the good thing is questions about two plus ions don't come up very often. And if they do, they are simply just asking about the effect of that on the mass to charge ratio. They're not going to go into a lot more detail about that. So you can see here that we've got three different isotopes of neon and the heavier isotopes are going to be deflected less. So that's the pathway number one, the black one and pathway number two. The blue one is your medium isotope, so it's deflected more than the, the neon 22, but is deflected less than the neon 20 because that is the lightest isotope, so it undergoes more deflection. And then we get a spectrum that looks like this. So at the detector, it will check how much of each of these ions. So we are measuring the abundance of each of these. And that is our spectrum that is being formed there. So a mass spectrum is going to give the following information. We are going to see the positions of the peaks to give us the mass of substances. We're going to see the peak intensity to give us the abundance. So the peak intensity is otherwise known as the peak height. And the positions gives us the atomic mass. And then the highest abundance is scaled to 100%. And then the other values are scaled as well. So we the mass spectrometer does all of this automatically. And we get a spectrum that has got the different peaks with their abundances already labelled. So you may get something that looks like this, where we have got a sample that has been passed through a mass spectrometer and we get this mass spectrum. So you can see that we have our mass to charge ratio and we have our height. So we have a mass to charge ratio of 79 is at 50.5% and 81 is at 49.5. And you can then determine the relative atomic mass. So you would have 50.5 times 79 plus 49.5 times 81, all divided by 100, and you would get a relative atomic mass of 
0.99. So back in IGCSE, you were given the abundances and you weren't asked anything about where they come from. This is now where the abundances come from. Now we can focus on the mass spectrum of diatomic molecules at this point. You will revisit the um, polyatomic mass spectrum later on in this course, but we're just going to focus on diatomic molecules because these are nice and simple. So diatomic molecules are going to contain only two atoms and we can analyze them by mass spectrometry and we can determine our mole relative molecular mass of the element and we look at our peaks and our abundances in order to do this. So if we have something that looks like this, we can see that we have a mass spectrum of chlorine, which is going to exist as two diatomic molecules. And we have a number of different peaks here. So this one here is a peak at 35. This one here is a peak at 37. And then you can see that we have three other peaks. So we have peaks at 70, 72 and 74. At A level, you are expected to be able to explain where these peaks come from. And it's actually a lot more simple than you think. So we have two main peaks for 35 and 37. And if we measure the abundance, we will get an abundance of 75 and 25%. Now, the other peaks come from the fact that we have a diatomic molecule. And all these peaks are is just different isotopes joining together. So if I have two chlorine 35s joining together, I'm going to have a mass of 70. However, if I get a chlorine 35 joining with a chlorine 37, I'm going to get a different mass, this time of 72. And if I have a chlorine 37 bonding with a chlorine 37, then I'm going to get a mass of 74. Now, this is the part that is a little bit more difficult, is understanding the peak heights. So let's take this nice and slow. So we said that chlorine 35 has an abundance of 75%, and chlorine 37 has an abundance of 25. So we had that from the previous slide. This means there is a three in four chance of selecting a chlorine 35 atom from a sample of chlorine atoms. So if I have a chance of t selecting two chlorine 35s, I have to multiply 3 over 4 times 3 over 4, which gives me a chance of 9 over 16 of me selecting two chlorine 35 atoms. Now we look at the chlorine 37. There is a 1 in 4 chance of me selecting a chlorine 37. So if I can... The chance of me combining that 37 with a 35 is 1 over 4 times 3 over 4, giving me 3 over 16. Now, I can have a 35 and a 37, so I could select the 35 first, followed by the 37, or I could collect the 37 first, followed by the 35. Now, both of these combinations have the same chance of being selected. They both have the chance of 3 over 16, but I have to take into account the fact that I could pick the 35 first or the 37 first. So what I have to do is multiply it by 2, telling me that the chances of me getting a combination with a mass spectrum so a mass of 72 is 6 over 16, whereas the 70 was 9 over 16. The chances of me selecting two chlorine 37s is 1 over 4 times 1 over 4, which is a 1 in 16 chance that my mass is going to be 74. So this now gives me a ratio of 9 to 6 to 1. And this corresponds to the peak heights. So if I go back to my spectrum here, the 70 is going to have a ratio of 9 to 6 
to 1 for the 70 to 72 to 74. And you can see that in the spectrum. You can see the different heights relative to each other. So what we can now do is we can use that ratio in order to determine the relative molecular mass of chlorine. So we do 9, our ratio, times 70, plus 6 times 72, plus 1 times 74, and divide it all, this time not by 100, but by the total value of 16. Because remember, all of these are 9 over 16, 6 over 16, and 1 over 16. And that gives us a relative molecular mass of 71 for chlorine. Now, because this is a diatomic, Cl2, that and that's 71, that tells me when I take my individual atoms, I get 35.5. And we already know that the relative atomic mass of chlorine is 35.5 because we can get that from the abundance. So this is just a further proof that isotopes exist and how we can use them to determine the relative molecular mass as well as confirm what we already know about the relative atomic mass. So we're going to do some questions that are going to give us some information about why we have this particular spectrum on the next slide. So we're going to be looking at bromine this time. So we have what are our relative isotopic masses? identifying the particles responsible for the peaks and then deducing the relative abundance and explain the heights of the three peaks. So we've got these here. So our first question was, what are our isotopic masses? And our isotopic masses are these two here. So our isotopic masses are 79 and 81. The second one, the second question was looking at what are the particles responsible for the three peaks? So for 158, that must be 279 bromine atoms combining. For 160, it must be an 81 and a 79. Or it could be a 79 and an 81. Remember the order is important here. And for the 162, it could be an 81 and an 81. Okay, so now we want to look at the relative heights and um, see how these tell us the why we get the, the peak heights for the combinations. So we can see that the abundance for 79 and 81 are going to be exactly the same. So that tells us that they are 50-50. So you get a 50% chance of finding one of these two. So that, in other words, is a one in two chance. So if we want to figure out, well, for 158, so the chance of two 79s is going to be 1 over 2 times 1 over 2, which gives me 1 over 4. The chance of me getting a 79 and an 81 is 1 over 2 times 1 over 2, which is 1 over 4 again. But remember, that's going to be equal to 160, but so is this one, the 81 first followed by the 79. So again, 1 over 2 times 1 over 2 is 1 over 4, but I need to add these two together because both of these two are going to have a mass of 160. So this becomes a total chance of finding an isotope that is at 160 as 1 over 2. And then the chance of finding two 81s, again, is 1 over 2 times 1 over 2, giving us 1 over 4. So you can see that the 158 and the 162 are exactly half because my ratio should be a 1 to 2 to 1 because we have a quarter to a half to a quarter.
So this is a past paper question and it's using very much the same spectrum that we just used. I just want to show you in terms of the marks, how you get these marks. So we want to complete the mass spectrum for a sample of bromine gas that contain, contains approximately half of the 79 and half of the 81 isotopes. Now, the intensity that we use doesn't matter as long as we get the correct ratios. So if I have 79 and 81, as long as they are identical height, then we would get a mark here. So let's make them, there is 79, and there is 81 at the same height. Of course, you would have a ruler when you're drawing these, and that would give you your first mark. Then we have, how do they combine? So if we have 79 times two, we know that that's 158. If we have 79 plus 81, we know that's 160. And 81 times two is 162. So our combinations should be our other peaks at 158, 160, and 162. So we have to then put that onto our graph here, our spectrum. So we have the 160, that's going to be the most common one. Because remember, these are going to be in a ratio of 1 to 2 to 1. Then we have 158 and 162, and these should be half the height of 160. So let's have it here. Again, of course, you're going to have a ruler when you draw yours. So we get something like that. So you get a mark point 2 for having the peaks in the right place for 158 and 162. Mark point three for having the peak at 160. And mark point four is for having them in the correct ratio. So for simply drawing five lines using a ruler and just making sure that the heights are the same, you could get four marks in an exam. These should be some of the easiest marks that you will pick up in this paper. So then we want to calculate the relative atomic mass for a sample that was found to contain 47% 79 and 53% 81. So this is exactly what you learned back in GCSE. So we have 47 times 79 plus 53 times 81, all divided by 100. That gets you your first mark. And the second mark is for the answer of 80.1, of course putting all of that into your calculator. And then what effect, if any, on the mz value of the peak if the ion detected had lost two electrons? Well, what we would see is our mz or me value is going to be halved. Because if you have, let's imagine, 79 over 1, that's going to give you a ratio of 79. But if you have 79 over 2, you're going to get 39.5. So you're going to half that value. And that's for your last mark. So that's everything for topic 2A, isotopes and mass, spectrum, mass spectrometry. I would strongly recommend that you do practice how to draw the mass spectra and you try the questions in the textbook. If you have any questions on the topic, please feel free to leave a comment below and we hope to see you back soon.